welcome everybody to our panel on green chemistry. My name is Bob Infleece. I'm a partner at Cox Castle and Nicholson in the San Francisco office and most proud to be a member of the adjunct faculty here at Bolt Hall. Green chemistry is the product of a heightened awareness of the dangers inherent in the way we manufacture goods and the materials that go into them, technological advances that hold the promise of safer practices in the future, and perhaps most important, the political will to actually do something about it. We hope you'll leave this session with an understanding of the issues and the linkage between what happens around the world and what's going on here in California and the United States. We're honored today to be joined by Maureen Gorson. She's to my far left. Ms. Gorson is the director of California's Department of Toxic Substances Control. She previously served as the deputy secretary for law enforcement and the general counsel of Cal EPA. Prior to that, she was the general counsel of the California Resources Agency. To my right is Robert Speer, who is a professor of environmental health services and is the founder, uh, founding director of the university's Center for Occupational and Environmental Health in the School of Public Health. To my immediate left is Peter Shaw. He's a partner with the global firm of Morrison and Forrester, where he heads, he's, he's a busy guy, he heads the <laughs> firm's land use and environmental group, as well as the firm's green chemistry group. He formerly served as a senior environmental trial lawyer during his appointment as an assistant U.S. attorney for the Central District of California. Welcome to you all for joining me. Let's start with Professor Speer. Bob, help us to understand uh, the principles of green chemistry and the problems that lead to it. Okay, well, I'm gonna have, I actually have a few slides to help me do that. And so we'll see if I can find them. Uh, here we go. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging that uh, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm of an age where I can't prepare slides like this, so someone clearly with more skill has done this, and uh, uh, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Schwartzman are here with us, and so I appropriated some of their slides. Um, <clears throat> and let me begin first by saying that I myself am not an expert in green chemistry, but I have spent a good part of my career dealing with the lack of adequate uh, chemical regulatory policies and controls, most of which my career has been in occupational health, the uh, problems of workers, uh, health problems, and to some extent safety problems of workers, where uh, you really do get to see uh, the dirty underside of inadequate policies with respect <clears throat> to uh, uh, chemicals. It's one one dimension of the problem. Um, so uh, the other side of uh, what brings me here is the fact that uh, I, I'm a, a long time sort of a university academic organizer and when uh, this green chemistry thing came along uh, in my own immediate environment, uh, the Center for Occupational Environmental Health, which I might say was actually legislatively mandated and grew out of a poisoning episode in California workers in 1977-78. Uh, then there was, this was clearly uh, something that uh, I was very interested in and have become committed to. Um, the other part of this is that uh, I think we here in California are not really in a position to, uh, uh, to innovate and to start something new to uh, address some longstanding problems. The train has largely left the station. Uh, and the train is being driven uh, by the European Union. And um, in a series of directives that began with the Cosmetics Directive in 2004, the restriction on hazardous substances in 2006, waste and electrical electronic equipment 2005, and then finally the REACH initiative, which is the driver at the moment uh, of chemical policies. And so when this thing began to, uh, to surface and come onto our shores was really uh, when Mike Wilson got involved with people from the European Union uh, and began to see the implications of this. And the implications for California industry, not only in the regulatory side, but in their business, 
are really profound. California has substantial economic ties with the European Union. We earn $63 billion a year from trade with the European Union. A million California jobs are generated by trade with the European Union. As an export market for California, the European Union is twice that of Japan plus China. We export to the European Union uh, chemicals, 2.4 billion, computers, electronic products, 9.2 billion. And of course, we are the top, United, uh, top state amongst the United States in exporting to Europe. So what they do really does make a, a difference to us. And so how they're addressing chemicals policy uh, really does mean that we have to pay attention to it not because we want to do a better job necessarily of regulating chemicals, but I would hope we do, but because it's an absolute economic need for California business to understand that system and to respond to it. And this was covered in a report that was commissioned by the California legislature and that uh, Mike and his colleagues generated a couple years ago, Green Chemistry in California, a framework in leadership in chemical policy and innovation, 2006. And then more recently, uh, at the uh, uh, beque be behest of the Department of Toxic Substances Control, uh, the green chemistry, uh, a, a shorter, more concise, and readable document, which is on the table outside for those of you who wish to see it. Uh, that was just very recently issued in 2008. So very quickly, I'm going to go through the motivation here for, for a, a real rethink of chemicals policy. Um, first off, uh, the daily California sales of chemical products, 644 million pounds, 2,700 such tankers. And the total U.S. daily chemical uh, imp production and importation, 42 billions of pound, pounds, 623,000 tanker trucks every day, okay? At the other end of the pipe is not the question of the upstream use of chemicals in manufacturing and uh, one thing or the other, but product waste is a huge problem. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at plastic bottles, of which we have some on the tables around here. Two million plastic bottles are discarded every five seconds in the United States, okay? That's a lot of plastic bottles. What's this? These are plastic bags. 60,000 plastic bags every five seconds in the United States. So uh, where does this go? Well, an unfortunately large part of it ends up in the, in the ocean. 90% of the floating debris in oceans is plastic outweighs phytoplankton six to one, and it should grow tenfold in the next 10 years. And you can find plastic in 48 to 86 percent of, of seabirds and marine mammals. What is this? Cell phones. Four, 426,000 cell phones are retired each day in the United States. What happens to all this? Well, Either the cities and counties of California have to deal with it in their landfills, or if there's an opportunity to do so, of course, we send it somewhere else. We send it offshore. And 80% of U.S. electronic waste is transported to Asia. And what happens to it there? Well, you can imagine. In California, hazardous waste is a real problem for us. 61 of 85 of California's largest waste sites are leaking into groundwater. 94% of those surveyed by DTSC pose a major threat to human health of the environment. And the EPA believes that 600 new sites will be needed each month until 2033. You find chemicals in breast milk, 287 synthetic chemicals and pollutants were detected in umbilical core, blood, mercury, I mean, you can go right down the list. Uh, and are these necessarily health problems? Well, maybe, maybe not, but they don't belong in umbilical cord blood, I would allege. And you can also make the same sort of uh, argument about the occupational health problems that I mentioned earlier, uh, about the health problems in California inf infants and children. And in the, in the Green Report here, there are some uh, documentation of estimates of what those costs are. 
But just strictly on the production side, growing 3% per year, doubling every 25, per, uh, every 25 years. And the major act that controls this in the United States is the Tosca Act of 1976, which one may allege has uh, some data gaps certainly uh, remain after its enactment. There were no data requirements for 82,000 substances in, that are in commerce in the United States. Uh, if you're a business and you want to buy some chemicals or buy products, it's rather difficult to find out what's in them. Uh, there are some accountability gaps. Uh, EPA, if you just think about the number of chemicals and the rate of which things are progressing, clearly can't cope with it on a chemical by chemical basis. Uh, there are few requirements for producer responsibility in Tosca. And then there's really very little incentive for investment in green chemistry or green technologies in our current regulatory structure. Now, to respond to this, of course, uh, just in 2005, 2006, the California legislature tried to respond and deal with some of these residual problems in chemical regulation. And as you can see here, there were 35 bills. And I don't think I have to tell you that uh, these bills probably don't cohere into some strategic whole in a particularly useful way. So the whole notion of green chemistry as has already been said, the design of products and processes to reduce or eliminate substances hazard to human health and the environment, and indeed to have some life cycle responsibility for producers to actually worry about the waste problem and not leave it in the hands of the cities and counties of California to deal with the ultimate uh, site of this sort of thing. And Maureen Gorson will talk about California EPA's Green Chemistry Initiative, which is an attempt uh, to really address the issue. Uh, and th these data gaps, safety gap, the technology gap, and the green chemistry opportunity, which is really a relatively, I would say it's an innovative way to address the problem, a new way to think about it. But again, the trains left the station and we're not inventing this here. We're uh, basically trying in some way to catch up uh, with what's already going on in the European Union. Uh, and again, not only for health and safety problems of California citizens, but for the health, and the health and welfare, I would allege, of California's economy to be able to continue to compete and compete aggressively uh, in, um, uh, in the European Union. And I think the same, I think Governor Schwarzenegger saw the same possibility for innovation in green chemistry and green technology in, in this area as he saw in, in AB 32 the same possibility for developments. And we can do it, as is often uh, shown. This is a, 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 the, the last slide here from showing what California has done in trying to restrain per capita electricity consumption from 1960 to 2007, and how we've departed from what's going on nationally and flattened out our consumption, whereas the United States continues to go up. So uh, the, uh, uh, I'm not completely sure how the green chemistry idea will play out, how it's going to turn into really manageable uh, and operational public policy, but I think it's a challenge that we really do have to address. And uh, I think uh, the university has a role to play in this. And it, uh, like all things in the university, not completely clear what that role is going to be or who's going to play it but we're uh, certainly ready to continue to working with the state government to address the, this whole issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I wanna go back to the question of the role of the university, but first, having somewhat defined the problem, I'd like to ask Maureen to talk to us about what has happened in state government and what is happening at state government to address the problem. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I'm the director of DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and we are one of the entities that comprise the California Environmental Protection Agency. And the California Environmental Protection Agency uh, is about 5,000 people on a billion dollar budget uh, located in Sacramento and some regional offices. And for the most part, for most of our history, we have been involved in implementing and enforcing 
uh, environmental laws uh, that were passed in the 70s, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, RICRA, CERCLA, um, and for the most part, we focus all of those people and that money on controlling emissions, wastes, and discharges. Uh, making sure that emissions, wastes, and discharges do not enter to the environment uh, and harm the environment and do not get into people's bodies. Um, just at our department, um, you know, he, we've get, gotten a backdrop, but at our department, looking at how we have been implementing RICRA and CERCLA, um, Hazardous waste generation has not gone down in California. It's actually gone up, um, even gone up per capita. 57% um, of our landfills are leaking hazardous waste. Uh, when I look at what's happening is, we used to have 570 waste facilities in the state. Um, now we have 127. Uh, most of the waste is now going to Nevada, Utah, and Mexico, and China so that we are still producing more hazardous waste, but we're not disposing of it in California, we're exporting it, where it may be $3 a ton to dispose of it in those other jurisdictions, and it's $40, $45 a ton to dispose of it in California. Um, the biggest growing part of my budget is now what we call legacy landfills, which is the landfills which are leaking for which all the responsible parties are long gone or BK, bankrupt. Um, and we're taking care of Stringfellow, Casmelia, and BKK right now, all on the general fund dime. So while we're a special fund agency, our funds are going down because the facilities that pay those fees are moving out of state. Uh, meanwhile, our general fund liabilities are going up. So just in terms of the regulatory authority we've been given, looking at continuing to do things the way we've been doing them since the 70s, we realize it's a losing battle. We're working in the Rapunzel hair salon. We're, we're managing the waste, <laughs> but we're not really reducing it. We're just moving it around, and it's not going away. So we've got to start focusing our entire regulatory uh, regime around how are we going to prevent this stuff in the first place. Okay, so that's what's happening in terms of just how we regulate day in, day out on the authorities we've had for a long time. Now, in the past three to five years, what the legislature has been focused on is toxics and products. Um, this carpet here may contain a lot of toxic materials and glues, uh, but until the university throws it out, we're not going to be very interested in uh, talking to you about how you're managing your carpets. Nothing ever gets thrown out here at Bolt Hall. Okay. Okay. That's the same carpet as when I well, went Well, that's school. good. <laughs> that will not trigger a regulatory requirement. <laughs> So you may have hazardous waste disposal requirements, and when you're ready to throw something out, we're, we're there to help you manage and dispose of that uh, in the way to minimize the uh, impacts on the environment. But people are increasingly being concerned that being in the presence of these products, uh, that we are harming the environment and harming our bodies. So what's happened in the past three to five years is that the California legislature has been passing laws and giving us new authorities to look at products. Uh, that we didn't have. So e-waste is a new regulatory regime where we've actually charged fees on products. People all now have to pay $35 when you buy certain electronics. Um, and we are now uh, implementing the ROS directive, which is the Restriction on Hazardous Substances, which is a European directive to limit uh, four heavy metals in electronics sold in California. And California is the first state in the nation to implement the ROS directive. Uh, we have laws now banning and restricting levels of lead in jewelry, uh, restricting levels of lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic in packaging and bags. Uh, we have new laws uh, requiring disclosure of ingredients in cosmetics. And we have a new law that's going to require Cal EPA with uh, the Department of Public Health to start measuring uh, biomonitoring in people's bodies. What are the levels of these toxic chemicals? Now, this has sort of been happening piecemeal over the past three to five years as we've been alerted to a concern, uh, like lead in jewelry. There was a, a, a boy in Minnesota who swallowed a, a Reebok chain on his sneaker, was 98% lead, and he died of lead poisoning. Uh, that's when we started uh, getting these laws that would give us the enforcement authority to go to retail stores, shop for jewelry, and if it had lead above 
600 parts per million, require that store to take it off the shelf. Um, so we're getting new authorities at the retail level that we've never had before. So we've been retraining our inspectors to become shoppers. So this is just the context of what we're, we're, we're changing as a regulatory agency. And the secretary said, you know what, these new ideas, cradle to cradle, uh, biomonitoring, um, green chemistry, we can't keep going on the way we've been going on for 40 years. Uh, we have got to look at how do we regulate um, the environment from, from the front end, from the design end. And so since April 2007 till the present, we've been engaged in an online uh, public fact-finding um, policy exploration. We're calling it wiki policy because it's happening online in a decentralized way where we ask questions about, okay, we've been doing cradle to grave environmental regulation for 40 years. What would cradle to cradle environmental regulation look like? What does that look like? Um, we, we know that uh, when we are alerted currently to something that may be harmful, uh, our approach is a risk assessment approach where we will study that harmful thing uh, we will determine how much of that harmful thing can be in the water, how much of that harmful thing can be in the air, how much of that harmful thing can be in our bodies. We look at the assimilative capacity of the environment and, and our public health, and then we set limits and standards and regulate the amount of that thing that can be in certain products. That whole risk assessment standard, followed by regulations, including bans, very one by one, chemical by chemical, slow, we're not getting to a more sustainable economy with that approach. So we're looking at, okay, if, if it's not that, what do you do when you've, you're, you're alerted to a toxic that's in a product or a toxic that's in an industrial practice? Um, is there a way to quickly innovate, to immediately ask the question in a regulatory way, is there a better alternative? And to have some sort of quick, easy, not five years, 10 years epidemiology study way of getting to something better right now um, and continuing to innovate immediately, whether it's banning, um, but also knowing what the next thing is gonna be. At Cal EPA, uh, because we have been organized in silos um, based on the way laws were passed in the 70s as we were alerted to smog and we were alerted to water problems. We have the air board and we have the water board and we have toxics and we have the waste board. And we're all focused on one particular environmental problem with certain toxicological endpoints. And so we have a, a history now of what we're calling regrettable substitutions. Certainly MTBE is the most famous one. When we required, the air board required MTBE and only to find out that that harmed water quality drastically. But we have tons of others. Um, when we regulate toxic air contaminants at the air board, that increases the amount of hazardous waste sludge. A lot of times we're just making a trade-off from one media to the other. Uh, when the air board puts pressurizing uh, requirements on underground storage tanks, uh, that increases the likelihood that they will leak. So we're making lots of trade-offs, um, but we, we don't have a system to see what is the overall in better environmental alternative multimedia over life cycle. So that is another really key thing that we're looking at right now, is what does that alternatives analysis look like? And I'll talk a little bit about what some of the options that are coming up through the stakeholder workshops and what's coming on on the dialogue um, on, on the blog. So it's how do you move to cradle to cradle? What does that look like? How are we gonna deal with the fact that there are a lot of harmful ingredients and products and currently we have no regulatory tools except for some of these ad hoc laws that are coming into place to deal with them and deal with their immediate substitution to something safer and more sustainable over the life cycle. What does that look like? And then finally, um, it's the fact that this thing, this safer substitute that we want to mandate or propel people to move to may not have been invented yet. And we have learned a lot uh, over the past year where we've had green chemistry experts from every academic institution doing green chemistry um, in the nation that there are a lot of barriers to green molecules that are inhibiting the um, creation of green molecules. And when you talk to chemists in the lab, 
the ones who invented plastics, okay? Because that's not something, the raw material we dig out of the ground. That, that's a product we use every day that was invented in a lab. What were they thinking about when they were designing plastic polymers, right? Well, they were following the specs they were given, which was to create an inert material that wouldn't break down, that would have these various qualities. And by and large, they succeeded. They've created plastics that are gonna last in the environment for thousands and thousands of years. So whereas my legacy landfills, hazardous waste, we're looking at um, long-term stewardship funded by the general fund and the taxpayers for three or 400 years, the plastics waste is gonna affect thousands of years. So could you have in the lab designed molecules that had different characteristics? Um, the answer is yes, but that wasn't the design specs. And how are you going to stimulate that, the acceleration of that kind of innovation? Um, of course, there's gonna to have to be regulatory requirements. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, we, we wanna know, we wanna make sure that there's gonna be command and control regulation. That's not at issue here. What's at issue is what does that look like? And how does this propel us to this constant cycle of innovation, really applying Moore's law to environmental protection where we're constantly inventing something that's more environmental and less costly over time? So some of the other big issues that are coming in here is, you know, um, the previous speaker talked about the data gap, this issue of transparency in the supply chain. The fact that we do not know what we're, what's in the stuff we're using every day. Um, and not only don't we know, but everyone along the supply chain does not know. So that there's a lot of uh, people, intermediaries and product manufacturers that would love to know what's in the stuff they're buying and make better choices, but it is not transparent to them. They are not able to make those choices. So that's another big focus of how would we, in a regulatory way, uh, generate that information so that it is accessible and usable um, by every decision maker in our industrial economy. And really what you're looking at is what, how are you going to get from a cradle to grave economy where everything is manufactured to eventually be thrown away to a cradle to cradle economy, okay? And, and also a big focus of what we're looking at is what would be the metrics of progress there? How will we know we're getting to a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy and moving away from a cradle-to-grave economy? And of course, we're looking at metrics that have worked in the past. Um, the state had AB 939, which were solid waste diversion goals, right? So we have a way of, um, we've had a way of measuring and increasing the amount of solid waste that did not get disposed and got recycled. Uh, we have attainment goals. We are looking at the CO2 um, emissions goals. So transparency, the alternative analysis, the metrics of progress, and what do we require to propel innovation? These would be the key areas that we are currently struggling with. And I would invite you to participate because we are, are literally struggling um, online and in stakeholder workshops. A lot of people are thinking, oh, when's the government gonna have their proposal? If we knew how to do this, you know, we would just be doing it. Uh, this is not easy stuff, and, and we're asking hard questions, and we're asking for really the smartest people in the, the, the state and, else in, and across the globe to help us um, to design something that really the world has never seen. So um, I welcome your participation. I want to get Peter involved here, but I have a question first, Maureen. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not watching closely enough, but with all of the things, all of the great things that the Schwarzenegger administration is doing and has done, I do not see the Attorney General's office uh, enforcement activity picking up for illegal disposals of hazardous waste. Am I wrong, or is that your observation as well? Uh, no, you're you're wrong because. Um what, what's happening is, no, 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 really, we, we have been for the past two years uh, conducting very successful sting operations where we have been putting ads in penny savers, but for the most part, we are criminally prosecuting those people. We are not seeking civil penalties, so we are not referring those cases to the attorney general. Most of these things, are, we're working directly with district attorneys, district attorney. and we are mostly seeking jail time. What about that 57% of landfills that are leaking hazardous substances into the water supply, right. or at least into aquifers? 
What's happening there? Well, um, we are using really circular cost recovery to try to get money to to fix those problems. So if I looked at statistics of enforcement activity under CERCLA, the Cal equivalent of CERCLA, mm -hmm. 10 years ago and compared to today, I would see that the state is moving more aggressively? No. Okay. Well, you can't solve everything all at once. Peter, I want to get you involved here. Um, Peter was a government lawyer and is now uh, working on the same side as me on the dark side. What, what's your perspective on these issues? Thank you, Bob. Uh, I have to tell all of you how excited and honored I am to speak to you today, especially with this panel. Um, this idea, the Green Chemistry Initiative, is sort of flying under the radar, but it actually might be the most exciting, most far-reaching initiative ever undertaken in California much more so, I would argue, than carbon trading and our greenhouse emission control. Because what Maureen and her team are doing is proposing a radical reformation of an entire range of product cycles within the state of California. So when you think about it from its most um, uh, uh, top level analysis, how could anyone be against this? We're gonna take toxics out of the environment turns out that it's a pretty tricky question about how to do that, and that's what most of my talk is going to focus on today. I think that there are a couple of different ways to talk about environmental issues, and what I'm hoping today here in academia is to elevate that discussion about how we talk about these issues. So let's start from the beginning. The first rule of ecology, everything is connected to everything else. And if you remember that, that will animate the rest of this discussion we're going to have. So we're talking about green chemistry and removing toxics from products. A lot of that comes from people's perception of risk. And when we talk about people's perception of risk, um, I think there's a lot of things to think about. Um, when people perceive risk, they perceive risk in a lot of different ways. They perceive it mostly based upon immediacy when is it going to happen to me, and upon consequence. Do, do I really understand what the consequence of that risk is? So let me ask all of you who are out here today, why don't you take a look and tell me which one of these behaviors is the riskiest thing that you can do? Driving a car? Eating meat? Or as Maureen suggested, children's jewelry with 800 parts per million of lead? Let's talk about each one of these things. First. Um, when I think about green chemistry, I think about NEPA. So this was the first application of the precautionary principle to public policy. So uh, Richard Nixon brings us the EPA and brings us the Magna Carta of environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act. And what we're going to do is stop and look before we make major federal decisions. There's going to be an analysis of the environmental impact of that decision and then that will be incorporated into environmental decision making. And many of you probably know this story. But by design, there was no private right of action incorporated into NEPA. It was an information tool. And Richard Nixon purportedly said, this was the greatest mistake that I had ever made. Because there was a private cause of action. It just wasn't in NEPA. It was in the Administrative Procedures Act. And since then, an explosion of litigation has taken place. Some of it meritorious, some of it brought for the purpose of just delaying the project until the project developer wouldn't go forward. And I'm sure Bob could tell us uh, many stories about this on the state side, on the CEQA side. So this, this um, idea, the precautionary principle, and then the consequence of implementing that into public policy brought us litigation, and in some cases, just delay. Um, depending on your political standpoint, delay of a project that you don't like might be a good thing and it might not be a good thing. But I just want to focus on one arguably debatable example, which is highways. So in the United States, traffic uh, accidents are the leading cause of death for um, people between the ages of uh, six and 13, I think my slide is wrong, I think it's 31, I transpose my numbers. One person is killed in an auto accident every 13 minutes. 
there are about 45,000 deaths that take place in the United States from auto accidents. 15,000 of those are caused by substandard road conditions, obsolete design, or roadside hazards. Just the type of projects that would be addressed by improving those freeway systems. And so the takeaway message here is that the market will respond to public policy and to laws, but not just in an economic way. It will also respond in a litigation way or in a way where people assert their legal rights. And in this instance, there is not only a benefit from NEPA, but there is what I call a co-burden. The co-burden is the delay of projects which would otherwise benefit the whole increased highway safety and reduce traffic deaths. Let's take a look at that next example. We talked about driving a car and the risk of driving a car. Let's talk about eating meat. So meat production. The world's demand for meat is skyrocketing upwards. It's up 400%. Per capita consumption of meat doubles every 20 years, faster in developing countries than in developed countries. And so the third world is developing an appetite for meat. Uh, but beef requires 16 times more fossil fuel to produce than vegetables or rice. And meat production generates between the entire chain of meat production, 20% of the world's greenhouse gases. So let's do a thought experiment. What would happen if all Americans reduced their meat consumption by 20%? We would reduce greenhouse gases to the extent as if all of us would switch from driving a midsize sedan, like a Camry, to a Prius. But there are co-benefits that would come beyond that benefit. One is we'd actually reduce our meat consumption to the daily recommended level of the meat we should be consuming. We, we don't have to stop eating it. We would just reduce it to the daily recommended level, which would have the co-benefits of all sorts of health benefits for the American public. And finally, meat production contributes to almost three quarters of the water quality impacts in the United States. You know, you think about aliens coming to the world and saying to us, gosh, you folks spent an awful lot of money on carbon trading. Did you ever think about just eating a little less meat? Uh, the, the, the takeaway lesson here is public policy, properly designed, can have tremendous co-benefits as well. You can have co-burdens or you can have co-benefits. It's important to think about policy and risk by taking the entire picture into account. The problem is, is that we don't have perfect knowledge. We're gonna design the system with imperfect knowledge in sort of a half-step kind of way. So when you do that, then you get the problems that Maureen had talked about. MTBE is one example where you try to solve an air quality problem and you make a water quality problem worse. Or ethanol, what could be a better idea? than reducing air emissions through ethanol. And the co-burden of that is to drive the price of food up in the developing world and to cause people to shift from cutting down their forests to planting corn. So there are co-burdens that go with that policy as well. I have one more example which is pretty on point to the idea of taking toxics out of products. Let's talk about laundry detergent. So there was a push in the United States to remove phosphates from laundry detergent. Phosphates in the water supply caused algae to bloom. Algae blooms sucked all the oxygen out of our waterways, killed off fish and killed off the other plants. But there was no acceptable substitute for phosphates in detergent. There were alternatives. They just didn't work as well. So again, all of you as a thought experiment, you bought the new detergent and you washed your clothes and they didn't come out quite as clean as you wanted them to come out, what would you do? And the answer, of course, is you'd wash them again. And so you'd use water twice, you'd use electricity twice, you'd have twice the wear on needing a new washing machine, and you'd have twice the discharges of whatever the substitute chemical was that you used. Now, ultimately, what have we moved to? high efficiency washing machines that use less water, high efficiency detergent where you use less of the chemical, that actually taking the toxic out of the product may not have been the right answer. 
the right answer may have been in the delivery of the chemical to its ultimate use. Again, to get it just right, you need to have perfect knowledge, and we do not have perfect knowledge. Um, the Green Chemistry Initiative in California will be very far-reaching, and um, I had actually anticipated that Bob and Maureen would talk about the NEPA aspect of it, the part of disclosing, filling in the data gaps, but there's more to it. Um, I actually changed my slides last night because I got this email from uh, DTSC. So DTSC is now seeking comment. I expect all of you to respond to this request for comment after you hear my talk today about other ways to, to what are the consequences of trying to take the toxics out of products. And when you look at this list, I think it's pretty extraordinary. What information would trigger a ban of a chemical by the state of California? That's, that's pretty remarkable. What would the appropriate response by the state of California for failure to use safer alternatives be? I mean, that promises, or at least explores, a very extensive set of regulata regulations and a regulatory state. Um, I will say this. Uh, the state is very fortunate to have Maureen running this process, because I've known her for a long time, and, and she gets this, both from how the government works and some of the demands and the, the needs in a practical sense. So um, I still have my fingers crossed for the Green Chemistry Initiative and how this will come out at the end. Um, lessons learned. If the idea of the Green Chemistry Initiative is to more fully incorporate the externalities of the use of a product into the product's cost or the product's availability, that, as you saw from the other examples, may lead to unintended results because we lack perfect knowledge. That when we talk about the risk of toxic chemicals, the context in which that risk arises is very important. And I think that all of us do a service to the dialogue to elevate and educate people about this. That risk is risk in context, and you have to understand that there are going to be co-benefits and co-burdens to every choice that you make on that risk scale. The one place where I think everyone agrees are on these ideas, things that encourage conservation, efficiency, the use of renewable resources. There's no debate about that. I think that's common ground that everyone can agree on. Ultimately, we will enlighten ourselves and we'll have better policy if we can openly and freely talk about risk. Uh, I can just imagine what would happen if I had stood up here 10 years ago and advocated nuclear power. And all of the negative connotations that come from a phrase like nuclear power. But what we need to do is have a discussion led by people like those of you in the room that talking about risk, benefit, and co-benefit all together is the only way to ultimately get the best policy. Thanks, Bob. Come and sit back down. I have a couple of questions for you before we move to a slightly different topic. So, Peter, as an observer of industry here in California, what do you predict will be the response, say, in the next five to 10 years of the initiatives that Maureen has described and those that will come that we don't even envision yet? Yeah. Um, I'd say two things. One, um, certainly the European Union initiative is inspiring many of the multinational companies to immediate action. And by immediate, no large company can turn their battleship that quickly. It takes years of planning to get into a position to implement change. So there's a real need to anticipate that change. I think that for those companies, they're watching both REACH and Marine's efforts with great interest. Um, and I think those companies will be the first to adapt to whatever the new regulatory regime may be. Smaller companies are going to lag. I, I think a lot of them are not paying careful attention, and um, they will be surprised. I think this will really be a big thing for them. I, I don't know what your reaction is to that. One other question for you, Peter. Um, I was intrigued by one of the bullet points in one of your slides, that if we try to, uh, th through market-based forces, Cause, cause companies to capture their externalities that we might have unintended consequences. Can you give us an example of that? 
Um, sure. I, I think uh, the phosphate detergent example was an example of trying to um, capture the externality either in a regulatory way or um, by lifting the cost of a product. And you just end up with what was, would not be the best solution if you were omnipotent and you could design a system that would really optimize all of these outcomes. Um, I think one really good example of this is something that are called Pignovian taxes. That's where you take a behavior that you don't like, like smoking or alcohol, and you tax it to try to make it less desirable and more expensive. And using taxes as a method of public policy, a carbon tax or a cigarette tax, often does lead to un unanticipated consequences that you don't really control the behavior that just as many people smoke as would otherwise smoke without the tax. But what you do do is you shift the burden in a regressive way, the cost of the behavior to those that actually are least able to afford it. There's a lot of debate about, a lot of debate about the effect of Pignovian taxes. And I think those are, are fair, uh, fair topics to which there is a difference of opinion. When we open it up for questions, some of you may want to have additional questions on that subject. But before we do that, I wanted to go back to Maureen. Um, both you and Peter have talked, touched upon what's happening in the European Union and, and how that impacts this issue. Um, Maureen, tell us what Europe has done and how will those initiatives kind of shape the debate and, and the planning and, and policy here in California? Um, yeah, so European Union has uh, essentially passed something called REACH. I think it's the registration and evaluation of something, hey. something, something. <laughs> it's REACH, like reaching, right? I, I forget. Mike, you probably know. Registration, evaluation, hey, authorization. There and, okay. Too many words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. R right, reach. But but essentially, they're they're hiring about 400 toxicologists. They're placing them in Helsinki. Uh, this is going to be the new um, toxicological agency for the European Union, and they're requiring everybody who wants to sell a chemical in Europe to provide um, a certain amount of toxicological data and information um, in order to um, have the ability to sell in Europe. Uh, so. Certainly in the Green Chemistry Initiative, the ideas of the things that the European Union is doing are a lot of people are advocating for a California reach, where um, we would also be requiring toxicological information to be published, and if certain data wasn't provided, there would be no market in California for those, those chemicals. So that's certainly an idea that's coming through the Green Chemistry Initiative. But other than that, what, what you have is the legislature picking things it likes that the European Union is doing and then passing a law to do the very same thing in California. So that's like the Ross Directive. How did it turn out that Europe led on this issue? You know, I don't know. Is it, be, it perhaps the strength of the European Union itself is what creates these opportunities? I don't know how it started, I'm okay. afraid. Peter, anything else about the, the initiatives in Europe that you'd like to add? Um, well, it is interesting, isn't it? I think the Europeans, as you know from your sessions this morning, um, also were very aggressive in moving forward with emission trading. But um, there was uh, carbon or um, there was emission trading here in the United States and California quite early as well. Uh, it is interesting, isn't it, the sort of the socioeconomic and political environment in California compared to in Europe and what makes it the birthplace of a lot of these environmental mm -hmm. initiatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that the, um, the Swedes have been here and they have set some very, very ambitious goals for the elimination of toxic use in Sweden. Um, I think they're, they're setting, you know, like toxic-free society by 2050. And so the individual member states are also uh, pushing an agenda that's even more aggressive than the European Union's. Maybe the answer is that there, was a, there may have been a perception 50 years ago that the United States was leading on these issues. But in fact, when you look at consumption and waste, we were never leading on these issues. We were always behind the curve. It's just more obvious now. In any event, um, Bob, you had touched upon the, the role of the university in green chemistry. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? 
Right. Or the potential role for the yeah, university. To some extent, it goes back to <clears throat> the role the university had in assisting California's government in the post-World War II period, where uh, the university was used in many ways by the legislature as kind of a think tank for a variety of things. I think I'm told that the university had a lot of impact in the California Water Project and so forth. Um, but in this particular issue, there, there, there are two or three main uh, roles I see. One is as a convener. Um, it, it seems to me, and I think uh, Peter made the point really clearly, that uh, there's nobody going to sit in a room and figure out how to do this. This is going to be an extraordinarily challenging, and it's going to be, by its very nature, it has to be an inclusive process. Uh, it, it, so it seems to me, and, and maybe because of what's going on in Europe, we'll see a more positive attitude on the part of industry to participate and help craft uh, uh, the, the, the new paradigm. Um, it, because I think if it's gonna work, we're gonna really need that participation uh, in a big way. And so the university, I think, can act in this role of convening, hopefully, uh, the, uh, the government, the industry, the various and sundry stakeholders to try and uh, uh, provide a forum, a place for this discussion to go on. Uh, the, then there's the obvious issue of sort of individual niche pieces of research. Uh, certainly in chemistry, all the things that Maureen said about plastics and degradability and one thing and the other. Those are the kind of things we do well. But, but we, there are individual people in the university who do these things, and one of the, the tasks will be to try and bring uh, this issue to their attention, because they're not the kind of people that are going to be necessarily uh, uh, out there thinking about chemical regulatory policy or other things. So it, it's going to be a question of trying to access those people within the university with specialized knowledge and skills in much the same way as any other, like the Manhattan Project, if you will, okay? Um, and then finally, I think the university's role, and this is a more formidable and challenging one for the university, is gonna to be to be a good example and role model of how to operate a major industry, business, whatever you wanna call us, uh, and adhere to the kind of principles that we all feel are important and necessary. And uh, there's some, some beginnings being made, I think, by the individual campuses uh, in this regard, both, both in terms of greenhouse gases as well as, as green chemistry. But it's early days, just like it is for other aspects of the economy. But I think it, it will be important for us to, to serve as a role model and a good example. We're not terribly good at doing that, but I have hopes that maybe that'll be a, a third important role we can take. Is, do you envision the role including uh, members uh, of the law faculty and public policy, or is this essentially going to be the, the, the chemists and the, the hard scientists? No, I think, I think for some of the reasons that, that have been outlined here, I mean, there are, there are going to be profound legal questions and policy questions and economic questions that are difficult now to foresee. Uh, but I think there's going to be a role for, probably there's even a role for the classics department. I don't know what it is, but uh, the Greeks probably thought a lot about this at some point. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a very wide-ranging uh, group of people who's, whose input will be needed. Okay. Um, as, a, as an amateur economist, I, I'm particularly interested in um, the role of the marketplace. Um, now, I think it's natural to assume that in order to accomplish the things that we need to accomplish, we're going to have to have a regulatory uh, structure, some form of command and control, or some alternative. Let me f start with Peter, but I think Maureen and Bob also might have some insights on this. So, would it be possible that organic changes in the marketplace itself could address these issues in the absence of government regulation? Uh, I'd say the answer from my standpoint is I don't know. Um, certainly it's, uh, I think, one of the most profound changes we've seen in environmental law in the time that I practice is the increased awareness and market pressure that's driven on companies to go green. 
Walmart has said their objective is to become a 100% zero waste company. Um, Daimler Chrysler has developed uh, a prototype of what they call the 100% recyclable car. It's made largely out of plastic. It's um, pretty light. It weighs about 4,000 pounds. Um, these uh, innovations or um, attempts are coming to the market without a formal regulatory driver to, to those products. So there certainly is a lot of pressure and a lot of built-in incentives uh, in the marketplace driving some of the same objectives, I think, that Maureen and her group are trying to come to. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Maureen? Yeah, no, when we're, we're looking at, you know, the, the brainstorming wiki policy part of our, our green chemistry initiative generated something like 57,000 web hits and 818 different options. And um, we have a science advisory panel, which is PhD chemists, but also includes economists and lawyers as well. Um, and they, they've been sifting the comments into supply side and demand side. Right on options that affect consumer demand, meaning consumers have more information and can make better choices, versus supply side, which could be regulatory and other other requirements. Um, but certainly, you know, when I've talked to certain industry sectors, like uh, the specialty advertisers that make little pins and giveaways at trade shows, since most of their customers are Fortune 500 companies, they all want green giveaways. They don't want to give anything that has anything in it at these trade shows. So the supply of the portfolio of these companies is getting very, very green because the, de the, the customer demand is this unique subset and they only want green giveaways. So there you have a very strong consumer demand side pull to green the entire supply chain. Now that's a little unique. So I mean, what we're looking at is both supply side and demand side. You need the whole thing to start propelling us to a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy. I would think, though, that even tort law would play a role in it. If I'm a toy maker nowadays, I'm going to want to have a whole lot of information about my suppliers and what goes into the plastics and other materials mm -hmm. that I'm using to make my toys so that I can feel comfortable that I'm adequately managing my risk. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, workman's comp in the workplace has really made the workplace much, much safer. Tort liability has made products much safer. But there's a lot of environmental endpoints and toxicological endpoints that don't really get addressed by those. If they're you know, bioaccumulative or persistent or aquatic toxicity, those work very well for acute toxicity, uh, but not so much for these uh -huh. longer term toxic issues. What do you think, Bob? Can, the, can industry do it as well without government intervention, at least kind of comprehensive intervention? Well, I certainly think there would have to be the government threat. Um, I mean, you know, the, the classic example is reach. I mean, uh, we've seen a tremendous activity going on. Uh, you know, Mike was reporting to me this morning that they went to a conference yesterday that the Department of Commerce was running in Silicon Valley, just bringing the, the, uh, the actual demands of the reach uh, uh, legislation as it's uh, as it's being rolled out, uh, so that the people in Silicon Valley can understand w what it is, and uh, there was a lot of attention being paid to this that clearly wouldn't be uh, paid at the same uh, time scale or on the same time scale without it. Now that's not to say that government I I in a regulatory context is going to invent the solution. That seems to me to be unlikely. But it does seem to me to be likely that industry or the, the general regulated community are going to come up with solutions in response uh, to the threat, to some extent, of the government doing something that would really be unhelpful and egregious. Now, if I were graduating in May from the Haas School of Business, could I be looking at green chemistry as a way to make some money? Is there an opportunity to make a killing here in green chemistry? What do you think? I think there, there, there possibly is. I mean, um, I think more people are looking for products that don't have any kind of toxic impact. And if it performs as well and it costs the same and it's better, uh, people want it. What people don't want is something that costs more and prefer, performs less well. Mm -hmm. Well, judging by the interest of venture capitalists in this business so far, I think we can say yes. 
yeah. there's definite <laughs> thought that money sure, can be made. Sure. At I mean, least there's I, probably 100 people out there right now thinking about this issue and how to make money on it. Yeah, no, I mean, Sony has funded um, researchers at UC San Diego who are creating basically like edible lighting for televisions. Yeah. Where you could you could eat the television you if could you could liked eat it. You could eat the television. Okay. Yeah, okay. Steve Jobs is going to probably present that at MacWorld. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Edible computer. The luncheon ought to be uh, interesting there. Now, yeah. I was intrigued by the um, email that Peter flashed up on the screen there, where the state is actually, um, it's up there now, um, in kind of a, a comprehensive way asking California what they think about these issues. And that reminded me, Maureen that um, your agency is doing some pretty innovative things to get the public involved. What are you doing and how does that differ from the past? Well, I think um, for the most part, government agencies will, will hunker down in their cubicles. They'll come up with some sort of proposal and then they'll put it out there and they'll listen to comments on that proposal. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop policy in real time online. So all the questions we'd be asking ourselves in the cubicle alone, we're asking online. So th that list of questions is pretty provocative. And the reason it's so provocative is that when we ask kind of more polite questions, <laughs> no, I'm serious, more polite questions, uh, people don't really tell us what they think, right? So we are trying to be provocative to stimulate them to tell us what they really think. Because it, it has been difficult for stakeholders, they're, they're still waiting for us to come out with our proposal. And, and like, no, we're really developing it online with you. How many responses would you anticipate you're gonna to get to that email? Uh, well, when we use magic words like tax and stuff, uh, <laughs> then we sort of start generating a lot more comments. So, <laughs> will there be a team of folks whose job will be to go through all the responses and pick out the good stuff? Oh yes, we, we have teams of people who went through the 57,000 web hits last time and generated giant matrices of options and, and categorized them and cataloged them. So, you know, we're, we're trying to gin up more comments, but we're getting into the meat of the matter now, which is how. We've talked about whether, we've talked about why, we've talked about what, and everybody's been talking very nicely about this, but we're getting to the how and who funds it part and now nobody wants to say anything. <laughs> so that's why we're really, really poking them now. Well, it's refreshing to see the state going out of its way to make it possible for ordinary citizens to be involved. This is very different than the typical public hearing where if you're lucky you get a hundred people to show up. This you can attract comments from tens of thousands. Well, so not only that, when people come to the stakeholder workshops, we put them to work. Dress comfortably because we put you in little work groups and you're supposed to draft policy in the work group. Interesting. And then you have to discuss what you came up with in Do front you, of the whole group. When is the next time that there'll be a stakeholder workshop in this area? Do you know? In this area, we're gonna be uh, doing something with the Ella Baker Center in Oakland. Um, I think it's April 23rd. Great, is, that available, is the information available on the website? Yes, Good. absolutely. Okay, one last question before I open it up to the audience. And this is directed to the two lawyers on the panel here. And I don't want to bore anyone with the law here. But um, one has to ask the question, is the Commerce Clause going to get in the way of California leading the federal government on these issues? Is that a concern? Um, I think it depends how those regulations are designed and uh, what they finally um, come out with. Uh, I would guess uh, that there will be Commerce Clause challenges no matter how the government designs their program because of the concern that we'll end up with a kind of balkanization. Uh, you can sell the product here, but you can't sell it there. Um, there already are such regulations where California has California-only products that can be sold here. Um, so I think it depends exactly how that regulation is written, whether or not um, an argument can be made that it's protective of a California business or discriminatory against an out-of-state business, uh, whether there's a legitimate purpose. You all remember this now that you're here at Volt, mm -hmm. of the Commerce Clause tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, our, our understanding is if the, um, the regulation applies to products sold in California regardless of where they're manufactured, then we're good. Right, okay. but if we somehow favor California manufacturers over others, 
That's where we're running to problems. Undoubtedly, there will be a fight over that issue, though. No question about it. Okay, now one last question for Bob before we turn it over to the audience. So at 3.30, I teach. 75% of my students will have Nalgene bottles filled with water. Do I need to tell them to throw those out? Uh, just tell them not to buy any more. Okay, that's what we'll do. Well, uh, does anyone in the audience have any questions? And if so, just step right up to the microphone. Oh, I stole the microphone. You stole the microphone. I did. <laughs> suppress the questions. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm with the California Energy Commission, but before getting into energy law, I practiced asbestos litigation. And asbestos is probably the most studied uh, substance in conjunction with health effects. And the manufacturers knew back in the 30s, early 40s, of the toxicity of asbestos and the injury it can cause. Um, with all this green chemistry and so forth, you barely touched on really uh, the current status of the government must prove it's dangerous versus the manufacturer proving that it's safe. And with asbestos, they knew long, long ago it wasn't safe. They continue to sell it. Here we've got 80,000 chemicals or so, where I believe you know, most of the time, probably the manufacturers nowadays don't directly know that there's a danger, but they may not know anything about the chemical really. And so I, I think what we really need to do, and I'd like to hear your comments on this, is that you got to put the responsibility on the manufacturer because it, you just can't burden government uh, to try to test all these chemicals. Uh, and every time you know, the government tests five, well, 50 came on the market that week. Government tests more, it's just never going to catch up. So well, the primary thing is, is before that thing gets put on the market, because once it's on the market, it's so much more difficult to pull it off. We still have a large asbestos legacy uh, from the years and years of asbestos use. So, up front, uh, what's your take on um, having the industry show the safety of the chemical before it's released and nipping it early on than trying to go back and say, well, gosh, we made a mistake here. Thank you. What do you think? Well, f that, that is really embedded in a lot of the things that are being discussed. I mean, when we talk about transparency in the supply chain, um, I don't think at any point of the 57,000 web heights or any stakeholder meeting, people thought the government was going to fill in the blanks. So um, almost all of the ideas assume that industry is filling in the blanks. We're just trying to figure out which blanks do we need filled in when and how. Um, so I don't, you know, I think the, the move to alternatives analysis and transparency and away from risk assessment is, is sort of that EU reach approach where you're, you're gonna tell us what's in that stuff. Do you view the Toxic Substance Control Act at the federal level a failure? <laughs> it's been on the books for decades now. Well, what it, was it supposed to do? What was it supposed <laughs> to do? What has it turned out that it's done? What? What, is, what was the intent and how has it turned out? Um, I, if I could, I, I think a TOSCA was enacted to protect the public from toxic chemicals and to require that there be a way to ban those new substances that would come to market that weren't fully vetted, weren't fully tested. But the problem is, is that with TOSCA, so many chemicals are in existing use or not subject to this initial review regime that very few chemicals, I, I'm not sure how many were banned under TOSCA, I think none were. Like four or something. Or four or yeah. something like this. Yeah, yes. no, okay, if the purpose was to protect us from toxic substances and products, then it's not really working. <laughs> and then it's not really working. Uh, if I could respond a little, though, on the question of asbestos. Asbestos is a terrific example. Um, you think about asbestos now in hindsight, and you say, well, we never should have used asbestos. We should have used fiberglass, which doesn't have the same fibrous in injury from and inhalation. Um, but that, again, kind of assumes perfect knowledge. I, I think you also have to ask questions like, at the time we started using a lot of asbestos, what was the alternative? And what would the resources be necessary to use that alternative? A asbestos has caused a lot of injury, and it has also caused a lot of litigation. Asbestos, when properly used, is an effective insulin and it can be properly managed and properly disposed of, but it wasn't. And so it, I think these questions about chemical substances that can cause injury, 
there, there's a lot that goes into how do they cause injury? Are they improperly used? Is there a proper application for it? Is using that chemical in some instances better than the alternative, especially when you consider the co-benefits? And again, think of things like DDT and the, the amount of crops you can grow with DDT at cost. It's a very complicated balancing question, and we ban DDT. It is amazing, though, how many products ended up with even small quantities of asbestos that you know, you, you think back, well, why did it have to be there? Um, so, next question. Picking up on the, the question of Tosca, uh, two questions for Peter. Um, that the, the fundamental problem, I think, that Tosca left us with was this market failure. That in the last days of negotiating Tosca, the requirement of, chem of companies, chemical producers, to generate and disclose toxicity information was given away. And, uh, and so we ended up with, over the last 25 th or 30 years, a market in which there's, that's driven by the function and price of chemicals with much l less attention to their hazardous properties. And so, not being an economist, but uh, <laughs> uh, my understanding of that is that that's a fundamental market failure. The market isn't working on the, the, the number of cylinders that it should. And so, the market then ends up uh, being failed. It affects our research priorities. It affects investment. Uh, it affects education. It affects the companies that survive or die. And as we are functioning now under the current market, we have uh, hazardous chemicals that are competitive on the market. So the EU now is estimating that there are about 2,000 substances that are used in high volume across the, EU, uh, the EU that are a very high concern for their effects on human health as a consequence of a similar failed situation uh, in the EU you know, that they're responding to through a fairly uh, heavy regulatory hammer that they have to require disclosure uh, and also get to the question that this gentleman Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is off. Okay, so, so the question is, if uh, if you really think, uh, the first is, if you think it's possible to correct that the, the market frame without a robust regulatory structure, uh, uh, and the second is, if uh, your clients are beginning to see the opportunities um, for new investment in, in green chemistry and safer materials and what have you, uh, as they're beginning to see in the, in the EU? So uh, the question was, um, will there be uh, the opportunity to make these corrections in the absence of regulation? And second, what are the market opportunities that may exist when the regulatory regime comes into play? I think those are both excellent questions. Um, first, the question of uh, can um, we have better disclosure in absence of regulation? Um, I, I think it's a, that's a multifaceted answer to that question, and, and I uh, will only uh, try to hit one facet of that. I think when you talk to um, professionals that work in assessing the risk of chemicals, that is a very imprecise science. And, I, and oftentimes, I think the public looks for information from a risk assessment that is very difficult to generate and certainly difficult to replicate that two scientists doing a risk assessment will come out with the same answer. So I think that the uh, quest for fuller disclosure, while um, admirable in the abstract, in execution is, is quite difficult to do. Um, and I think there's a lot of disagreement about the toxic properties of a lot of contaminants, uh, solvents, chlorinated solvents, uh, uh, some of the other products I think that would be addressed by REACH. So um, having said that, of course, uh, as Bob says, the train has left the station and there will be regulation that will require the disclosure. And I'm sure there'll be some scientific controversy about the sufficiency and accuracy of those disclosures. And would that happen without regulation? I think the answer is no. 
I think without regulation that you wouldn't see that. Well, you know, with e the European Union is going to collect all this toxicological information. We don't necessarily need to collect the same information if they're collecting it and they're willing to share it with us. At the same time, California's embarking on a biomonitoring program to test what's in people's bodies. Within four years, we're gonna, that information is going to start flowing in and we're going to have these two giant sets of information. Chemicals that we are now have much more information about their toxicology because the people in Helsinki will be making that web available and information about what's in California's bodies. So I would say start start looking at what you got now and start figuring out what are the safer alternatives now because it's it's coming. You know, even if we don't come up with a really innovative framework and alternatives analysis, something to get us away from our traditional government risk assessment. In four years, there'll just be bill after bill after bill after bill to ban it. So either we come up with something in this process, or um, it, it's coming anyway. Um, regarding the second part of your question, the market opportunity, um, there are <laughs> estimates that when you look at the internet and the, uh, the tech boom in the Silicon Valley, that the internet today is about a hundred billion dollar business. Um, the opportunity in this space, in the chemical and petrochemical business, the energy business, is about a $16 trillion market. So it's uh, 160 times greater than the internet market. There's a tremendous, this is the next wave. The next wave of innovation and economic opportunity is in clean chemistry and in um, uh, um, pollution, emission control, sustainability, uh, renewable energy sources, absolutely. Last question. Uh, I'm Linda Brothers, I'm a partner in Sun and Shine, um, and know just enough chemistry, I guess, to be modestly dangerous. <laughs> but I guess all of this sounds well and good, and uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but I guess my fundamental question that I haven't heard the answer to is, how are you gonna define a green product when you get it? I mean, there's the discussion of asbestos, which in its usable form is usually not a problem. Mining, it is a problem. There's the discussion of DDT, which uh, almost killed a, a species of birds. So I guess the question is, are you gonna look at something as fundamental as the Ames test and the impact on bacteria? Are you gonna look at mice livers like we did with benzene? Or are you gonna look at environmental impacts or just human impacts? And how are you gonna weigh those in determining what is clean? Uh, green, excuse me, uh, for, a for a chemical? Well, I, I think I talked that the metrics of progress is a area we are really struggling with in the Green Chemistry Initiative, and that's sort of going at what you're talking about, although the metrics we're looking at are life cycle multimedia, and so there's, um, I would say, three or four different versions that are coming out at the stakeholder workshops. One is called The Matrix, uh, which uh, would put chemicals in a comparative analysis through a matrix of hazard traits, um, and that would enable us to determine which one is better than another one. Um, uh, another is some sort of life cycle analysis, uh, but we're calling it LCA light, because of a full-blown life cycle analysis is like a full-blown risk assessment, could take years or decades. Um, so people are looking at, you know, um, standards and tools, matrices, life cycle analysis, decision trees, um, different tools to get quickly at what would be greener as opposed to defining ultimately what's green um, because that ultimate green. And, and we're looking at things like the LEED standards for buildings so that um, buildings are getting greener all the time because of the LEED standards. People are seeking certification of gold, silver, platinum, or even if they're not seeking it, they're borrowing things that are coming out of that that are getting more cost effective as more and more buildings are using them. So um, there are all sorts of life cycle multimedia metric systems that are being proposed, um, but there may also be within it um, some sort of toxicological testing um, that's required, and you know you get pass fail on those things. Bob, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, just one. It, it, there's no perfect way to do it, and uh, uh, the the main thing is that whatever system is come up with or arrived at, you know, you, you want to hopefully it's good 90% of the time it's going to lead to the correct decision. But the key thing is that the whole system can't be brought to a halt 
by some argument over one particular chemical. I mean, that's not to say you can't have an argument over one particular chemical, but the whole system can't stop. In this country now, the system has been basically brought to a halt because those who wish to oppose any change have figured out how to jam the system. And uh, so I think the whole idea of the green chemistry thing is uh, it just it just changes what the statisticians would call the type one and type two error, and puts a bigger uh, premium on uh, making uh, the right decision most of the time and accepting the fact you're going to make the wrong one occasionally. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and for their great questions, and ask the audience to join me in thanking our panelists.